Amen. All right. Uh, how many of you have heard? I, I, I won't be able to see your hands, but how many of you have heard? Uh, can the devil repent? Can the devil, uh, would the devil have the ability to repent? Well, uh, the problem with that is, is not the repentance. The problem with that is, is that if the devil won't receive the truth, he can't repent. And because the devil will not accept the truth about himself, then he won't be able to repent. One of the things I'm going to show you from the Bible this morning is, is that there's some truths that are in the Bible that are harder truth than just intellectual truth. There's heart truth. There's things that deal personally and individually with you. When you read in Ephesians chapter number four and even some of the things in Galatians chapter number five, you would be surprised at how many Christians think that all it is is about how you dress, how you walk and how you talk. Well, in wrath and envy and strife and division and unruly behavior and, and seditions and those kind of things that show up in 1 Timothy 3, they show up in Galatians 5, they show up in Ephesians 4, those are all emotional characteristics. Those are things that have to do with your personality traits. Those are things that have to do anger and wrath and malice and, and those kinds of behaviors. Those are things God deals with. You say, God's not a psychologist. Yeah, but He deals with emotions. He's saying that those emotions are rooted in something else. Now, you remember the passage in the Bible, in the gospel, where the Lord's talking to the Pharisees, and he said, you know, it's really strange to me. You've got a telephone pole sticking out of your head, and you're going around trying to pick a splinter out of somebody else's, a toothpick, so to speak, out of somebody else's eye. And what you don't realize is every time you turn your head, you're smacking everybody else in the head while you're concerned about, concerned about a little speck of dust. Well, oftentimes when it comes to us looking at ourselves in the mirror of God's Word, we're looking at everybody else instead of looking in our own eye for that big extrusion, that telephone pole sticking out of our own eye, and it blinds us to the truth about ourselves. And it's a difficult thing for you to accept that because if you don't accept the truth, you're akin to the devil who refuses to accept the truth, and the truth I'm talking about are truths about you and I. Personal truths where the Lord deals with Jake over there in the cornfield and they're out there wrestling and he calls him out and he said, and who are you? He calls Samson out the same way. He calls Paul out the same way when his name is Saul. He calls Peter out the same way. See, it has to do with whether or not you'll accept the truth about yourself. It's not an intellectual truth. It's not a truth on Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 or Genesis chapter 6 or Acts chapter 17 or Daniel chapter number 2 or uh, Revelation chapter number 16. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with personal truth. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the most important thing in your life, I just heard the old preacher say this thing again, is after uh, 62 years in the ministry, he said, I've learned this. The most important thing in a man or a woman's life is his fellowship with Jesus Christ. What you're going through right now is a great test of how your fellowship is with Jesus Christ without being able to have the fellowship with the saints. Uh, people talk about uh, running and hiding and we've been accused because we've had the doors closed and being in compliance and that kind of stuff. I'm used to taking the hits from it. I'm not saying it doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect me some though. It's, uh, they sure are making a snap judgment. They're living in some place. They got one case and we have more than that. But, but here's the deal. How come they didn't mock and belittle and make fun of people in the catacombs as a friend of mine told me this week? When they were hiding underground, why didn't they come out and make themselves known? And what, get put on a stake and burned alive, get eaten by lions and bears and tigers? Why, if you were living in China right now, you know what they're doing in China right now? Do you have any idea besides jacking things up and making everything and making you buy from China and, and, and running a secret war against you, which you probably don't know much about that, and, and trying to do some things to subvert? That's from the Communist Party that's there. Oh, so you're saying the virus. I didn't mention the virus. I'm not even talking about the virus. I'm talking about what's going on economically behind the scenes. You know what they're doing in China right now? They're taking crosses off of buildings and anybody that claims to be a Christian and anybody that's not communist, they're persecuting them, putting them in jail, having sanctions against them and cutting off their ability to be able to buy, sell or get gain. Where's the article from all the preachers that are out there talking about the mark of the beast? Why don't you go over to China? Why don't you load up over there and talk about your right to free speech? Why don't you step out into the light and wind up there on the street corner and preaching, you know, because they can't take your inalienable rights away from you, your inalienable rights, because all men are created equal. You want to tell that to them over in China? They're the same as you are. They're flesh and blood. Their skin color may be different. How come they can't get out on the street and do that? They're underground over there. The churches are underground over there. The preachers are underground. Here's a good one for you. You know what's going on in Saudi Arabia? 
while they'll take you out in the public square out there and take your head off your shoulders if you try to have subversive uh, meetings and do things like that. How come nobody's got outcry about that? Why is that only in America that they're trying to take your rights away in America? Why don't you pack up and try it in Israel? Why don't you try it in Pakistan? Why don't you try it where some of our missionary friends that are up in Germany and, and in Switzerland and they go in through the uh, back doors up there and they have meetings and help pastors and stuff in India and in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan and uh, uh, Karakistan and places that are like that that are fully Muslim and they have to have armed bodyguards and, and be it the, the, uh, under, to keep the thing underground. Uh, how about that? You want them to just come out and wind up being a martyr so you can preach about them? See, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to explain to you is, is accepting the truth about yourself is, is realizing sometimes you'll even use a crisis for the sake of making your own reputation for yourself at the expense of other people. I don't think you're being foolish at all to not come to church. Why, if they only know your Christianity by the fact that you gather in a church service, you must not have much of Christianity. If your only day to make a statement for Jesus Christ is your car parked in the parking lot because you're at a drive through church or you're at an outdoor church or an indoor church, I don't care. They you think they're taking your tag numbers down? Preacher, they know that. They're taking your names down and they want your name, address, and phone number so that they can uh, track you down now and they can follow you because they're going to track you to see whether you have it. It's the beginning it's what they did to the Jews and all that kind of stuff. Well, who, why aren't you waiting until now? Why don't they know you at work? How come they don't know you in the business place? How come they don't know you in other places like that? And now all of a sudden they only know you because of the church you go to? I don't understand that mindset. You're supposed to be a Christian all the time. <laughs> I hear some people now, I know a few of them that are out there talking about their right to assemble has been taken away from them and you can't find them in church except four times a year. Somebody dies, somebody gets married, Easter and Christmas. And the rest of the time, and now all of a sudden they're ready to lock and load because they're taking my rights away from me to gather and that kind of a thing like that. You're using the church for your own political uh, 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 ideas, your own uh, recognition, and your own political reputation. That's what you're doing. The truth of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, this passage right here that I'm going to show you in just a second, that Bible says that the devil can take you captive at his will if you won't acknowledge the truth about yourself. Some of you are just rebellious by nature. And so now what you're doing is trying to use something going uh, against the county or against the city or against the state that you live in or against the country, federal. And you're using that spirit of rebellion to rise up and now you've got some justifiable cause to stand up there and stand for your rights. Well, I don't agree with you. I think you're a hypocrite. I think you should have been standing for it long before now. I think you should have been coming when the doors were open and now all of a sudden you can't come and you're one of the ones screaming the loudest. How about the people that are here every time the doors are open? How about the people that are here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? They're here for special meetings and stuff like that. I see people now, you can in a revival meeting with Brother Donovan or Dr. Ruckman or whatever, you can't find them with a flashlight. And now they're talking about, we ought to be gathering, we ought to be gathering, we ought to be gathering. Now I realize I'm speaking the majority of my church folks here. Some other people might be listening and those kind of things and maybe y'all have that problem. I don't really have too much of that problem here, but it's a statement that needs to be faced. In 2 Timothy chapter number 2, notice what he says. The Bible says in verse number 25, in meekness instructing those Look at that. Who oppose themselves. If God peradventure, that means if God perchance will give them repentance. How? To the acknowledging of the truth. If they won't acknowledge the truth, God won't give them uh, permission to, to, I mean, He won't uh, grant them repentance. What would they be repenting of if He doesn't, if they don't admit what the truth is? Now, there's a number of ways that the devil can get a hold of you and so that you happen to know and understand. Your heart can be blinded to your own condition. Look in Ephesians chapter number 4. And this is a hard thing. That's why personal preaching really uh, bothers people. It upsets people. You say that you want to grow. Your fellowship with the Lord is the most important thing. But in order to do that, you have to do self-diagnostics. That means you have to put yourself under preaching. You have to put yourselves under teaching. You have to put yourselves under the authority of the Holy Spirit and the Bible that will point to you and say to you, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you, preacher? What's wrong with you, uh, pastor? What's wrong with you, wife? What's wrong with you, husband? See, the problem is, is like my mom used to say, whenever you point your finger at somebody else, remember there's three of them pointing back at you. Uh, the problem is, is that the better you are at pointing out everybody else's problem is more indicative of the fact. That means it just, it represents the fact that you got a real problem. 
If all you see is everybody else's problem, the problem is you refuse to see yourself. If you'd stop for just a minute and recognize that if every time I'm doing that, God's trying to say something to me. Maybe he's showing you and them what he's trying to get you to see about yourself. Look in Ephesians chapter number four. It's called blindness in heart. Look in verse number 17. Ephesians 4, 17. I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. So number one, what you think of yourself being a legend in your own mind gets a hold of you. I'm right and everybody else is wrong. This is what I think. This is how I feel. That's, that settles it. No, God said it. That settles it. But the vanity of their mind, number one, the mind gets away, the man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Watch verse 18, having the, understand, the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through ignorance that is in them because of blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work uncleanness with greediness. Now what you need to realize is, is that your heart can be deceived. That Bible says that your heart can be deceived. And the Lord said he'll give every man according to the desires of his heart. And the Lord doesn't want to do that. We're supposed to desire truth in the inward parts. The difficult thing is, is a lot of those truths about ourselves, uh, they're, not, they're not fun to look at. They're nauseating, to be honest with you. How about self-pity? Uh, how about feeling sorry for yourself on a regular basis? Uh, how, how about some of the things that maybe you're running through your mind rather than list those things out? Uh, how about you do your own work on that? And sometimes the Lord shows you that stuff and you're like, well, that may be true about me, but... And then you start pointing at somebody else. That's one of the ways of knowing. What is that blindness of heart? Refuse to accept what the truth is about you. Take your Bible, if you will, and come to uh, Job chapter number 1. Job chapter number 1. Now, uh, I, I, I know it's a rough time of the year with everything we got going on to... Um, to be kind of hard on you. But ladies and gentlemen, th there's, a, there's a real truth right here. And that truth is, is the fact that when God tries to reveal truth to you, if you don't accept that truth, you don't stay where you are. Remember that old preacher used to tell you, used to teach you, uh, uh, tell you on a regular basis that the most important thing to understand is, is that God will give you truth. And if you walk according to that truth, you have light. The Lord of God is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But light rejected becomes lightning. Do you remember that? Most people forget that. God will show you a truth about yourself. You refuse that truth. You think, oh, well, I'll just, I'll come back to it later. No, the lightning strikes. And the more time that lightning strikes, the more you get hardened off, the more you get calloused, the more difficult it becomes to get you to see that truth about yourself because your, dark, your, your understanding about yourself is darkened. The light can't get in there. The light can't show you that those personality quirks and traits are not just because you were dropped on your head or because something happened to you along the way. It's because you refuse to change. Listen, if you're saved, you got a new daddy. And you have the ability, if I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, I can change, but i got to be willing to accept, first of all, what do I need to change? Well, for some of us, it's our behavior. The anger, right, the strife, the wrath, the strife, the emulations. You know what happens? That light comes in and floods our soul. And the Lord said, these are things that are not like me at all. I'd like to see you change. You know what you say? I ain't doing it. Now, let me show you why that's important. I'm going to come to this passage in a second, but listen to me. If you get off doctrinally one degree, the longer you stay on that pathway, the further you are from hitting the destination God set you out to be. This becomes extremely important because then you start taking the Bible and instead of doing 2 Timothy 2.15 and rightly dividing it, then what you start doing it is in order to support your way of thinking, you start taking passages out of context to fit how you feel about something. You say the root of that's doctrine. No, the root of that is how you think about yourself, your reputation, wanting to find some new thing that the Abraeans did, the, excuse me, the Athenians did, and they're always looking for something new in the Bible this and that and the other. And here's what happens before long where clearly the Bible was rightly divided before. Now all of a sudden it's kind of, well, I, I know what it says and I know what I used to believe. But, you know, in the book of James, careful. Well, you know, in the book of Hebrews, careful. And then before long, you know what you're doing? You're taking the doctrine of eternal security and you're spinning it like John Calvin. And you're saying, well, we do believe in eternal security. No, no. And I say I believe in eternal security. That's a gift I got at salvation. That's not something that can be evident to you by how I live and what I do. That gift is given to me the day I'm sealed to the day of redemption. And that is to the uttermost. 
in spite of what some preachers are trying to tell you now. Well, you can't really say you're saved to the uttermost. Well, I can't according to the Bible. The day I got saved, I'm seated with Him in heavenly places. Now, if I'm a Calvinist, here's how I say that. Well, I believe in the uh, perseverance of the saints. That's the P on the tulip there. And I believe that you are ever live, I mean, that you're going to make it to the end. Uh, but we're going to put it in the preacher's hands, the pastor's hands, to determine whether or not we really are saved by our church attendance and by the way we dress and by how our families run and how we handle our finances and whether or not we read our Bible and whether or not we do what the pastor said. That's akin to popery. That's akin to going to the Pope and letting the Pope tell you whether you're in or not. You say, where does that come from? That comes from a blinded, wicked heart that is so bitter against someone else that they take a biblical doctrine that gives people security and gives people rest if nothing else does and make them doubt their salvation to put them in a harness, to put them in a yoke, to put them in bondage, to put them in handcuffs, to put them in a straitjacket, to lock them in a jail cell and allow their salvation to be in the hands of the preacher. Tell me if I'm saved or not, preacher. Well, how's that going for you now? You video clipping everybody in the church to see whether or not they're really saved? Who are you to determine my salvation? That Bible says, I'm saved by grace through faith, that not of myself, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Whether I'm a preacher, whether I'm a pastor, whether I'm a teacher, it doesn't make any difference. I'm saved and sealed because of what God did for me. You don't add anything to that. You have a problem with rebellious people. You have a problem with people that don't want to live right, do right, act right. Okay, preach the Bible to them. Tell them God's going to blister their britches and all that other kind of stuff. But when you take that Bible and you spin it where you make people doubt a gift that God gave them, boy, you're just as wicked as the devil himself. You just spin it just enough to, well, you know, James is really church age doctrine. And if we go to the book of Hebrews, those passages there, uh, that we're talking about a different time. That's not really tribulation passages. And you know, we know in the book of Matthew, you, Matthew, you mean Matthew before Paul was even written? You mean Acts when there's a transition going on that you've always taught and now you're just twisting it? You say, where does that come from? I can tell you where it comes from. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It's looking for a following. It's just being different for the sake of being different. And you're blinded by it. And all of a sudden you jump on a bandwagon and then off to the races you go. And then the next thing you know, you run a whole bunch of people off into the ditch when you go in the ditch yourself. You say, preacher, but you know, isn't that just because they're off doctrinally, intellectually? Uh-uh, that problem's not an intellectual problem. What led to the intellectual problem was a heart problem. What blinded them was the blindness in their heart. That's what got them messed up. And the next thing you know, they're off in a ditch. Good guys, wonderful guys, uh, nice guys, live right, do right, act right. Boy, got them a big bunch of people and all that kind of, and then make you just doubt. Now, you know, if you really want to know if you're saved, come see me, I can tell you. Really? How's that possible? You know what I just heard one of them say not long ago? I asked, a guy asked him, he said, well, this preacher was a preacher for over 30 years and found out that for all these years he had been doing all these wicked and ungodly things. What do you have to say to that? He goes, oh, never saved. What do you mean he was never saved? His testimony was he was saved as a kid. What, what, what are you saying? Well, if he was really saved, he wouldn't have done those things when he got up later in life. Where, where do you, so if you'd have seen him in the earlier part of his life, you'd have said he was saved, but because he, yeah, what, wasn't saved. He wouldn't have done that if he was saved. <laughs> really? I can't even imagine in my mind's eye what you must think of yourself when you see yourself in the mirror. You must not think that pride and arrogance of spirit that you have about yourself. You must not think that's sin. You must not think laden people off into the ditch and making them doubt their salvation and doubt eternal security. You must not think that's sin. Why, in that Bible, you know what that Bible says about you? That Bible says there's a place reserved for you in hell that is worse than Hitler gets or Buddy Mary gets. You say, why? You get the greater damnation. Well, I'm sorry, you're teaching false doctrine, so are you saved or not? Can you be saved and teach false doctrine? Sure you can. Absolutely you can. You can make a mess of things all along the way. Pete did it and had to get things straightened out. Peter did it and had to get things straightened out. Paul had to get things straightened out. All throughout that Bible, men, as they grow and learn certain things, they realize I made a mistake. What do you do? What's evidence of it? I go back and say I was wrong. Now let me make the thing right. But the problem is, is that you make allowances of what things you can see. You can't see in a man's heart. I'm glad you can't see in my heart. You say, why? God, good secret keeper. 
God's still working on me. I like that song you used to sing, to make me what I ought to be. And sometimes he's like, takes a ball of clay and a fruit juice glass and he jams that in there and he cuts all that stuff off of that. And instead of thinking, I finally fit the glass, he gets a smaller glass and keeps on working until he works that flesh off of me and he's still working on me. But God help you if you make people doubt their salvation based upon your standard of living and what you think is a, a evidence of their salvation. They're saved because they did what God said to do in the Bible, not by whether or not they attend church, dress like you do, walk like you do, talk like you do, go to the mission field, go to the Bible school, don't get a divorce, don't, whatever your rules are, they're saved based on what they do. And God help you if you make them doubt that. I don't doubt that you're even saved, even though you're doctrinally incorrect. But I wouldn't want to be you at the judgment seat. I know what you're saying right now. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be you either. It's time a preacher called out some preachers and not because they're deciding to gather or not gather for teaching things that make people doubt the eternal security that God gave them a long time ago. In the 1950s, when that old preacher started coming along, a lot of people don't know this. In the 1950s, he come along in John 15 where they're talking about uh, hewing people out of the vine and cutting people out of the vine and so on and so forth. He came along with the teaching of standing in state. He came along with the teaching of fellowship and sonship. Man, you talk about creating a rift. You talk, you talk about creating problems in the body of Christ. You say, why? Those verses had been used for years to keep people in bondage. He came along and said, you can be saved and, be, and act like an idiot. You can be saved and be out of fellowship. He used the illustration of the prodigal and things like that. But in the 50s, man, you talk about what strange thing, what new doctrine is that? But what he started doing was, as he read that Bible and read that Bible and read that Bible, you know what he realized? Evidence that you're out of fellowship might be able to be determined by what you're doing or not doing, but it has no evidence at all to do with whether you are or are not saved. And boy, did it create all kind of trouble. You say, why? I remember when we used to run in the prisons and stuff like that. The one thing we got opposition on more than anything else was the doctrine of eternal security. They'd let us pass out pretty much any track, including anti-Catholic literature and stuff like that, which we passed out some of the things along those lines. But you get ready to hand out that little green booklet called Eternal Security. And on the front there, there's a little fire burning and a guy with a sword and, and talking about eternal security. We've had chaplains actually take those out of our hands when we're handing them out and take them up from the people that are there because they didn't want them to know. You say, why? That's how they keep them in order. Well, if you're saved, you'll be a good little boy when you go back to your cell. Well, whether you're a good little boy or not, if you're saved, you're saved. You say, well, you can't say that. I'm basing mine on the Bible. What are you basing it on? Your preference? I don't believe people would commit murder, rape, and robbery. How do you explain Galatians 5? You can't explain it. I don't care how theological you are. I don't care what a great journalist you are. I don't care what a great writer you are. You can't explain Galatians 5. It's so plain. It's as clear as a nose on your cotton-picking face. If I walk in the Spirit, I'm going to do this. And if I walk in the flesh, that. It has nothing to do. Well, there's an inheritance there. Yeah, I inherit the kingdom. If I do what God tells me to do out of obedience, I wind up inheriting a kingdom. It has nothing to do with salvation. Romans 8 and 2 Timothy 2 or 1. You understand that. I, surely you understand that. And what you do is you take that and say, see, that's an unsaved person. Why don't you rightly divide your Bible and now all of a sudden it's kind of like, well, can a Christian be saved and act that way? Galatians 5 says he can. Let me ask you a question. You've been saved here, all of you that are out there, you raise your hand, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. You ever had a wicked thought? You ever uh, uh, tell a lie? You ever cuss? You ever break the speed limit? You ever do things that you shouldn't be doing? I haven't said one thing about on the outward appearance and, you know, commit robbery, rape, or murder. Well, if the Bible's right, then are, are you lost or saved? Well, I'm still saved and I've done every one of those things. You say, what, you've thought evil of somebody? Yeah, I'm thinking probably evil of some people right now. You say, why? I get wore out with some of you people that try to steer people into bondage when the Lord said in Isaiah 61, I came to set the captives free. You try to force them into service. You try to force them into doing something for the Lord because you think that's evidence of them being saved. You give them the wrong concept. Listen, I'm a servant. I'm not a slave. I understand the concept of a slave. I'm sold under sin. I'm set free. Now I stay here because I want to. I like it. I enjoy it. I love it. I don't have to. 
He's not interested in forcing me. That's why his long suffering is one of the greatest attributes that he has. Because if I don't do right, he's not real quick with the whip. Because the, 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 the idea is, I don't want to have to force you or whip you into service. So maybe put your buggy whip up. Maybe put your plow up and maybe put up your uh, thorns and stuff and stop trying to shape people into your image and let God work on them. That'd be good for some of you women in here too. You just uh, happen to realize everybody's not quite as spiritual as you are. They hadn't got uh, a bunch of kids to raise or they don't homeschool or they don't uh, wear three-quarter length sleeves and knee-long dresses and, and they, don't, you know, they wear too much makeup or not enough makeup and every barn needs paint. I don't care who you are or you do or you don't wear jewelry and all that. Since when did you be the, the, the trendsetter? How about you pray for them as much as you talk about them on your cotton picking Facebook and all your uh, apps and stuff where you talk constantly talking about what everybody is or isn't doing. You say, what are you doing? You're no different than the preachers that are preaching false doctrine. You know what you're saying? If you want me to get off your back, I'll put pressure on you and you start acting like I think you ought to act and, and then you'll be one of the gang. You'll be in the clique. Some of you are mean-spirited. And if that's the case, then the Bible says your problem is you won't accept the truth about yourself. Some of you have an inquisitive uh, mind. You should work for the National Enquirer. I don't even know if that's still out there anymore. <laughs> Facebook pretty much took care of that. You used to go to the grocery store and see the trash on the checkout counter. Now all you do is click a button and there's everybody's trash right in front of you. Well, preacher, that's how it is nowadays and stuff like that. Yeah, some of the preachers I'm talking to right now, you're a Facebook troll as it is right now and you're trying to put people under your spell saying that you're not sinning, putting out a whole bunch of false information about people and talking about people and running preachers down and running other people down on your Facebook post. You say, how do you know about that? People send me stuff. Holier than thou, perfect, godly, good men, that kind of thing. Really? And why are you talking about people like that? Why are you talking about that old preacher that's dead and gone? Why didn't you run your mouth about him when he was alive? I'll tell you why you didn't. Because you're afraid he'd bite the seat out of your britches. That's why. I'll tell you why you talk about him when he's, after he's dead and gone. I'll tell you why you wait to publish things until after he's dead and gone. Because you wouldn't dare publish it when you knew there would be an answer for it. And now you think, you know, because there's no answer to it and all that kind of... He's dead. But lest I digress, the talking about truth and accepting truth in the inward parts. And I'm about to run out of time for Sunday school. Preacher, good night. Well, the devil can get permission to mess with you. Look in Job chapter 1, pick it up in verse 9. Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and the substance and increased the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy faith. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. So Satan can go ask God if he can find a reason to do it. You know what he can do? He can ask God for permission to mess with you. What is the preference for him doing that? Him being able to see something in you where you didn't accept the truth and that opens the gateway. You ever wonder why 1 John 1, 9 is in the Bible as much as people talk about it and stuff? It's a hedge of protection against the devil making an accusation against you. The devil's not accusing uh, God of, some, I mean, accusing Job of something that's not true. The devil uses truth. The devil could fly up there right now and say to the Lord, uh, uh, you considered your servant peacock? Look at him down there. You know, righteous man skews evil, blah, 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 blah. The Lord's like, well, you got a different view than I do. And the devil said, well, he did this and this and this and this and this. And the Lord has to look down there. And if he sees me through the blood, he says he looks innocent to me. But if he looks down there and he goes, well, you're speaking the truth, but I'm giving him a break. You say what? He can't accuse me falsely. But he can take truth and accuse me. He doesn't go up and lie on me. He goes up and tells the truth. That's a dangerous thing. You say, why? Truth has a way of surfacing. Truth has a way of coming to the top. Truth is refreshing. And that old preacher used to say, I love the truth even if truth is against me. Boy, that's a, that's a statement right there. You know what he does? He goes up, he uses truth against me. And if God grants him permission, you say, what do I do? I insert 1 John 1, 9. Lord, I'm a liar. Lord, I'm a cheater. Lord, I'm a thief. Lord, I did this. Lord, I did that. Lord, I did this. Wash me in the blood of Jesus Christ and cleanse me. And the devil goes up there and said, did you see what Peacock did over there? And the Lord looks down there and said, no, can't see it at all. Looked clean to me. But if it's unconfessed, if it's not under the blood, I didn't say for salvation. I didn't say confess to the preacher or somebody. I said, I go to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. If it's confessed, guess what? I got a hedge of protection. The devil said, the Lord said, he ain't got nothing you can use against him. 
But when it's unconfessed, you know what he can do? He can take them captive at his, the devil's will. And you know what the problem is with Christians? The devil can go up there and you say, you see how that guy's a legend in his own mind. Look at his ego taking control there. Look how he twisted the scripture. You think I twisted the scripture in Matthew 4? You think I twisted the scripture in Genesis chapter number 3? You think I'm the God of this world and I haven't twisted the scripture and got 35 different, 35,000 changes in the Bible? You think since 1901 when the ASV was picked up and this country started going south way back in 1901 when the greater than what's going on now happened, when they replaced the king? King James Bible back then. You think I didn't do something there? Why? Look at him. He's twisting the scripture. And you know what the next thing you know? The Lord said, well, you're right about that. I guess it takes one to know one. The devil said, well, then let me add him. So then you know what happens? That heart gets darker and it gets darker and it gets darker. And then no matter who sits down with you and no matter how much Bible they say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Acts 2.38, Acts 2 and speaking in tongues, uh, all, the, all the passages that have to do with losing your salvation and you can't see the truth. Why can't you? You're blinded. You're blinded. You say, why? Won't accept the truth about yourself. And one of the things I really admire uh, about that old preacher, and I'm close here in just a second, one of the things I really admire about the old preacher, and this would probably offend some of you, uh, it would probably upset you, to even think about saying this. But he said it publicly a number of times and he said it to me uh, on more than one occasion because I would ask him, you know, what's the secret to staying in fellowship with the Lord and what's the secret to doing what's right to do? You know what he would say? He said, whenever I read the Bible, whenever I study the Bible, he said, the first thing I say is, Lord, I know I'm ignorant and stupid. <laughs> you know what most people who read the Bible nowadays, what they do? They say, Lord, uh, now in your eyes compared to you, I'm ignorant and stupid. But Lord, compared to my people, my constituents, my comrades, my, my contemporaries, uh, well, Lord, you know, you and I know the, <laughs> we know the real truth there. I'm the trendsetter. I'm the, I'm the guy that knows more than they know. I'm the guy, better watch it, better watch it. Pride goeth before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. You know what he used to say? He used to say, Lord, I know how ignorant I am. I know how stupid I am. And I know if you don't give me any light at all, I'll never get it. You know, one of the great statements he made, one of the great statements he made was, is I realize that the truth is up there, not down here. The answers are up there, not down here. I know what the problems are down here, even before he said I was saved. But you know what he said? But I've learned this. The truth is greater than me. The truth's up there. It's up there. It's out of this world. And nowadays what you have is, is a bunch of people that are being misled and misguided. I hope and pray you'll at least consider those things. You say, well, preacher, make it practical. Give me three shakes of a sheep's tail and we'll get ready for the morning service. How do I make this practical? Keep your sins confessed. Recognize you can be deceived even by your own ego and by your own pride. Be willing to accept when God shows you the light of, of your, about yourself. Be willing to instead of say, well, now, Lord, the way I don't argue with him, just say, Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. Help me. Help me fix it. Help me fix it. Help me fix it. He's not trying to hurt you with it. He's trying to help you with it. Now, if you did that, you know what you'd see? You'd see a revival that would sweep this nation and sweep your own personal Christian life and sweep through your families and your churches beyond anything you could possibly imagine. The old adage is, is we need revival. How do we have revival? We draw a circle around ourselves and get in that circle and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And until I have revival, I can't spread revival. One of the most difficult things is, is to accept the fact that there's still something wrong with you even after you're saved. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how many times you've gone to church and what specials you sing, how many sermons you preach, how many Bible school uh, 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 or certificates or, or diplomas you have or whatever. If that Bible's right, no matter what, until you're dead or raptured, you're going to always have a problem. Lord, I know I got fleas. I, I know I'm a dog. I know I'm this and that and the other. When I preach, you know that self-humiliation is not a good thing. Yeah, but for some of us, we won't tend to overdo that. Some of us, we have a tendency, we need a little bit of that put into the mix. Father, bless your word and thank you for the privilege of teaching and preaching. Thank you for the folks that are tuned in. Pray you'll be with us in the upcoming service. We'd ask your blessings upon all that we do in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.